I'm Carrie. I'm the founder of the Metro Detroit Charter Center. We are very pleased today to be part of this collaborative effort as we work towards working with all stakeholders here in the city to move the needle for our students and our families. We have the great honor and pleasure today to introduce Heidi Chang. Heidi is the founder and director of Attendance Works, a nonprofit initiative aimed at advancing student success by ensuring students are in school every day, starting with our youngest children. Attendance Works' goal is to ensure that every district in the country not only tracks chronic absent data beginning in kindergarten or ideally earlier, but partners with families and community agencies to intervene when attendance is a problem for children or particular schools. Attendance Works builds awareness and political will nationwide, advances state-level action and coalition building, and encourages local innovation through technical assistance, peer learning, and free online resources. A skilled presenter, facilitator, researcher, and writer, Heidi Chang co-authored the seminal report, Present, Engaged, and Accounted For, The Critical Importance of Addressing Chronic Absence in Early Grades, as well as numerous other articles about student attendance. As a result of her work on attendance, Heidi was named the White House, by the White House as a champion of change for her commitment to furthering African American education in February 2013. Deeply committed to promoting two-generation solutions to achieving a more just and equitable society, Heidi has spent more than two decades working in the fields of family support, family economic success, education, and child development. She served as a senior program officer at the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund and as co-director of California Tomorrow, a nonprofit committed to drawing strength from cultural, linguistic, and racial diversity. She has a master's degree in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government, and she is also a mother to school-aged children who attend public school in San Francisco. Let's welcome her and her team here today. Okay, let's see if I get the mic adjusted to the right level here. Um, it's such a pleasure to he be here. And first of all, actually, I'm going to ask Nicole. Can you stand up for a moment? This is Nicole Johnson. Uh, Nicole is our Associate Director for Operations, and with the support of the Skillman Foundation, thank you, we've actually started to do some more in-depth work here in Detroit, but we're just starting off, and some of you have maybe spoken with Nicole. Um, I do want to say that what I know about this work on attendance, um, Attendance Works is a very, very small national initiative. We've got maybe six full-time, if you added all our people together, five, six full-time people on a good day, mostly if we exist in our website, but we aren't just five, six full-time people because there are so many people who take our resources and tools and they make it real in their communities. And there are some folks in this room, I think I've known you guys for on and off for a couple, couple years now, and they're already moving on that, particularly some work that started first in South um, West and Brightmoor, and then there are other champions, Rod, absolutely, um, Lamont, other folks in the school district who are moving on this. Um, when I was in, just before this, you know, we were being interviewed by the folks at PBS, and they asked me, what makes this different here in Detroit? How do we know this isn't gonna be just one of those initiatives that comes and goes? And I said, because of the different groups you have in the room who are already committed to this. You have inside change agents, you have outside change agents. I said, Detroit's not gonna change because attendance works is here in Detroit. Detroit's gonna change because you've got champions and you're not gonna let this go. And this is gonna be a long haul piece of work We'll hear from my colleagues in Grand Rapids. It did not turn around in a year. It's taken a number of years. I've actually been connected to Grand Rapids in a variety of forms for probably about 10 years. <laughs> and it accelerated in the last four. So this is not an overnight change process, but it's the change that I think is so critical. One thing I wanna, uh, just to try a little bit of a connection to the conversation that was happening before. So how many people here hold a job? You hold a job? Yes, I'm hoping. What's the key to holding and retaining that job? What's one of the keys to holding and retaining that job? Show it up, right? <laughs> so well, I know we started with workforce, and this isn't exactly workforce, it is workforce. Because employers do not hire people who do not show up to do their job. Um, 
Another thing I thought about when I was listening to Captain Barrington talk, what a powerful, thank you so much. What helps people show up every day? What motivates you to show up every day? And what I think about is that it motivates you when you have hope for your future and what you can be. Even if you don't like the job that you are in now, you'll show up when you have hope for what that allows you to become, right? It's that destination you mentioned. And this is part of the journey. But not everyone makes it on that journey because we don't all have the tools and the resources, though we could, to make that journey. And what our job collectively is, is making sure that they get one of those skills which is showing up every day. And let me talk to you a little bit about why this is so important. So I'm going to back off for a second and go to the bit more mundane. And the mundane is understanding that we actually have to start using data that we have every day in a very different kind of way to know how do we build the skills and capacities of our students starting in the youngest ages to show up every day. Now, in Detroit, I know you've often looked at average daily attendance. But that answers the question, and that's an important question. It answers the question, though, how many students show up to school every day? And you need to know that, so you kind of need to know, um, you know, how many desks do I need? How many books do I need? That's different from the question of truancy, which is who's missing school without permission? And at some point, you might want legal recourse to help make sure that kids and families comply with compuls compulsory ed. And that's different from chronic absence, which is what we're going to talk about today, which answers the question, who's missing so much school they are academically at risk? And I don't care why they missed school. Could be excused absences, unexcused absences, suspensions. They missed out on the opportunity to gain from the instruction in the classroom when they weren't there. And by the way, one thing you should know is at the end of May, the Office for Civil Rights is going to be releasing the first time ever national uh, data set, and it will be searchable by school, district, and state on how many kids missed 15 or more days for any reason. That's huge. And it will allow Detroit to get a real sense um, of, of kind of how it compares. It's the first kind of comparative data. But let me talk again about why this matters. One of the issues with average daily attendance is that it easily masks the levels of chronic absence. You can have 200 kids in a school. 10 kids don't show up. If you have not, uh, uh, if you want to have, if you have 95% attendance, that's what 10 kids out of 200, 200 uh, sorry, 200 kids in a school, and we've got 180 days in a school year, right? 10 cut kids don't show up, that gives you a 95% average daily attendance rate, which is what everyone thinks is good. It's not the same 10 who, kids who don't show up every time. You could get that by having all 200 kids each miss nine days but that rarely happens. You never have all the kids miss the same number of days. Maybe you have 50 kids who miss 20 days, 1,000 absences, 800 left for the rest of the kids to split. You have to add up from individual kids so you can have very high levels of chronic absence, even at 95% average daily attendance, which is what those um, bars in the red show. And then once you're at like 90% average daily attendance, you're often talking 20, 30, 40% levels of chronic absence sometimes even. You have that many kids chronically absent, it's not just the instruction of the kids who are missing school, it's the instruction of the kids who are in the classroom, but there's so much disruption going on that the teacher cannot figure out how to teach to that you know, mix of needs. So, and we know from now research that, the ki that even when kids are chronically absent, some kids who, when they're kids who are not chronically absent, those kids are still affected by their peers, and the impact of chronic absence is even greater on low-income kids, kids with disabilities, and girls. Okay, now I'm going to try and move it up if you go quickly. Um, it's also true that truancy, which is just unexcused absences, can mask a lot of chronic absence, particularly in the early grades when, you know, five-year-olds don't sit there and think, I'm going to go skip school and not tell anyone. 
Not that that's even necessarily happening on our middle and high school kids. There's a lot of excused reasons why kids miss, chronic, miss school. Sometimes the reason we don't notice chronic absence is because it just happens sporadically. It's just two days a month. It's not every day in a row. So it kind of sneaks up on you. So we know that if we have the goal of attainment every day, I mean attainment over time, you have to have achievement every year. The way you get achievement every year is to have attendance every day. But for the kids who are our most vulnerable, this is going to require advocacy for all. So they have the conditions so that they can succeed and get there. We have plenty of research all about why proving attendance matters. Um, and you can actually go to our website and get more, but I'm just going to take you through a few things. But before I do that, I'm going to actually ask for three volunteers. Can I get three volunteers? And I need you to come up on stage. Oh, come on. All right. We got gotcha. you. Thank you. Give our volunteers a hand. So, your name, Takuma. And you are Sherry. And you are Barry. Barry. Sherry, Barry, and Takuma. I might be able to do this. Okay. We're going to start you guys behind the chairs, and you're going to line up three in a row facing me and next to each other. So here's Sherry, stop, and Barry. Okay. Barry, Sherry, and Takuma are all five years old, and they're just their first day of kindergarten. Yay! But you know what happened? You guys have started to do some high-quality preschool, but not every kid's been able to make it into it yet. And unfortunately, Sherry just didn't manage to get into that high-quality preschool at all. Her family, they didn't really weren't connected to the system. Sherry, can you take eight steps back to represent eight, nine months of learning that you would have gotten in kindergarten? I mean, pre-K, but you just didn't have a, a chance. Can I count to eight? Do I know how? No, but we'll try. <laughs> I know, it's tough without having gone to preschool. You might not be able to count to eight. Barry here, he got to preschool. They got in. His family was initially really excited, but then stuff happened. Your dad lost his job. House started having payment problems. Car broke down. And so you showed up for about three, four months, but then it, your attendance was so sporadic you know, they said, there's other kids who, who really want this slot. So you actually kind of got a little moved out of preschool. So you only got partial benefits. So can you take four steps back, Barry, please? But Takuma, he's good. He's ready to go. He's in kindergarten. He's excited. And you all got, because DPS has been investing in high-quality kindergarten teaching. So, you know, what happened was you got a great Kindergarten teacher, motivating, exciting. She knew how to message to the students and make it exciting. So you all got about eight, month, eight nine months of great learning. Can you take eight steps forward? And Takuma gets to set the pace. And you, it's, it's the same size steps because it's equal. You all get eight months. You got the same teacher? You get eight steps forward? Just the same size? You were counting, but, but the problem, Sherry, though, was that you, you know, this issue of not being very connected to systems, and then pre uh, kindergarten was the first time you were in a really good high, you know, care, but from an, an adult that wasn't your family member, so you kept having stomach aches, and actually one of the other challenges is you had a little bit of asthma, that was one of the things that was kind of, because your living conditions weren't so good, so you ended up missing, like, Oh, two months of kindergarten. And not all the days in a row, but that was a real challenge. And then it wasn't just the challenge the day you missed, it was the day you came back. And you had no idea what the kids were doing. So can you take four steps back? Barry here, he did a little better. You only missed about a month of school because that sorry. car thing was still a challenge. That transportation was an issue. But so you still missed about a month. So can you take two steps back, one step for the day you missed and one step for the days that you were kind of lost? But Takuma, he's really excited. He was great. And then you know what happened in the summer? 
because Chikuma was so excited about what he was seeing. And they passed by this library and they saw this with his mom and they saw this great literacy program because the community's kind of coming around. So you went into this library program and you know what? By the time you got into first grade, you were a month ahead of where you left. Take another step forward. But Sherry here, she wasn't so sure about this reading thing. She was kind of feeling disengaged and feeling nervous about it. So she didn't even touch a book all the summer long. So you know, by the time you got into first grade, you were actually another two months behind. Can you take two more steps back? And I didn't have glasses I needed. And you didn't have glasses she needed. So that was another real challenge. All right, who's going to be reading by the end of third grade if this keeps persisting and we do not interrupt it. Takuma, right? Thank you so much. That's an exercise that we do called Illustrating the Gap to help people understand what the impact of this is. And if you look, I think I better stand on this stool, otherwise you'll never see me. Um, <laughs> if you look at this, this uh, PowerPoint slide shows you in, like if you prefer graphs, <laughs> exactly what we just did with illustrating the gap. These is, this is Chicago preschool data, or Chicago data from a, a child um, from CPS, um, Chicago Public Schools, and the kids in the blue were the kids who were not chronically absent ever between pre-K and second. The kids on the far left, or yeah, whatever, <laughs> far, uh, far right over here, if you're facing it, um, this is the kids who were chronically absent pre-K, K, first and second. If you look, by the end of second grade, they need intensive intervention around reading. What we know from data um, in Rhode Island is that kids who were chronically absent in Rhode Island in kindergarten, if you trace their path as they go old, get older, they're more likely to score lower and that gap grows over time. If you can't read by the end of third grade, you know, you're in deep trouble because now you can't read to learn in fourth, fifth, sixth. By the time they're in, in middle school, they're more likely to be retained. They're more likely to be suspended. Kids who don't feel successful in school, who can't keep up with being in the classroom, they start to engage in other behaviors, right? and they're more likely to continue to be chronically absent. What we know, though, is even if kids weren't chronically absent in middle and high school, if they start to be chronically absent in middle and high school, when you have those scaffolded subjects, you cannot miss two days a month of algebra and still pass algebra. Too much builds upon each other. Kids, if they're chronic, they found this from Utah, this is statewide data, chronic absence, any time between middle and 12th grade, I mean 8th and 12th grade in your middle and high school years, one year chronic absence, 36% 36 of the kids did not graduate. Two years, half the kids did not graduate on time. And we know that while chronic absence affects all kids, its greatest impact is on low-income kids who just don't have the resources to make up for the time on task. So the big question, though, is while this stuff is all not that surprising, what can we do to address it? What we know is that the key to addressing it starts with figuring out why would kids miss so much school? Some of it is those myths. The fact that kids don't understand that, you know, absences easily add up and that it's not just the absences that occur without permission, it's even absences with permission because kids are sick that can add up. Some of it is because of barriers and you have a lot of these challenges here in Detroit. I totally get it. You have transportation, you have health, you have trauma, you have lack of, a lack of safe path to school. But one of the reasons you want to understand how absence is set up is if you understand the consequences, then you won't let those barriers go unaddressed. If kids have as, who have asthma don't feel comfortable coming to school because they don't think the school knows what to do, or you even have triggers because of the environmental conditions in school or in your public housing, you realize, no, but if I want to give my kids a chance to succeed, then we're going to have to figure out something to do about the asthma issues, right? 
But then there are also the issues of aversion. And I have to say, you know, if you have a poor school climate, if you see suspension data going up, and it's suspension for reasons that are, you know, the kid wore the wrong clothes to school. Do you know that in places they still suspend kids for being truant? I'm like, who came up with that idea? That is not about the kids. That's about administrative ease. But you know what happens to kids who feel they're unfairly suspended? They not only miss the day they were suspended, they miss the day they were supposed to come back because they feel like they're not wanted, right? And if parents had a negative experience and they see their kid get suspended, they'll be like, I don't want my kid to go through what I ha had in my school. So you know what, honey, you don't have to go to school. So if aversion is an issue, then we got a problem. And then there's these issues of engagement or disengagement. And I actually really, again, connect that to our prior presentation. That's about making learning engaging. So kids know that I want to be in the classroom, not out here doing something else. And this is particularly for the you know, older kids who, in a little way, you know, my kid, I have a middle school kid. I trusted that he got on the bus and he showed up at school at the other end this morning because I wasn't there to see him. And that means I need school to be sufficiently engaging. So he'll get off the bus and show up, walk into school and not go do something else. So if we know these are the issues, they help us to figure out what are the solutions. That said, we know that there's a standard set of practices that helps you both create a deeper culture of attendance that debunks those myths, while also helping you to figure out what in your school, in your community, are the deeper issues that need to be solved? So at a school site level, you have to recognize good and improved attendance. And by the way, sometimes recognizing good and improved attendance is as simple as a teacher greeting every kid by name in the classroom and saying, I am so glad you're here. And if they weren't there saying, hey, honey, I miss you. And by the way, they're more likely to learn from you if you're a teacher if you actually have a personal connection to that kid. You have to engage kids and families. Things like walking school buses to walk each other to school. Kids and families who I know this middle school um, after school teacher who created a texting club so the kids would all text each other to wake up. You can have parents help each other in carpools. But then we also need personalized early outreach so that we know Who's starting to miss too much school so we can reach out to them at a personal level, find out what their challenge is, and change what's happening? And then we have to have at the school, we have to monitor the attendance data and practice. So particularly so we can see, is there a programmatic barrier? Let's say, let's take this issue of asthma again. We notice that all the kids with asthma are chronically absent. Then we need to do a deeper dive on what's happening with those kids and what are the issues that we need to solve because it's not a one-off solution. It's a programmatic solution. What we know is this is about taking a tiered support approach. You have to build in this tier one. By the way, I do want to say this recognizing good improvement, it's not about perfect attendance. If you do perfect attendance awards for the year, that's fine. But you're not motivating the kids with the worst attendance to improve. And that's the goal of this. We've got to motivate them through creating engaging classrooms, through helping families understand what they miss, through making sure that we're um, really creating a whole school-wide culture of engagement and seeing attendance as part of that. And then we need tier two supports. So those kids who need a little bit extra push, and then for the kids who are really challenged, have major challenges in family dynamics, that are maybe making them miss as much as two days a month, I mean, not two days, but two months a year, that's like four days a month, then we might actually have to really require that we bring together our public agencies, because often these kids are systems known, so that they can coordinate the work. Because sometimes, for example, in the foster care system, sometimes it's even what we're doing to intervene that is creating absences for those kids because we're not making sure that we're thinking about the school experience as part of making sure that kid has a pathway to a better life with the support of our systems. What we really see needing to happen is building in place 
these systemic ingredients of support. And that's actionable data, so data that tells you as soon as kids are chronically absent, and by the way, we have to start with the district, because the district or the charter schools, you have the data, you gotta be able to crunch it, you gotta be able to analyze it, and then you gotta be able to share it with community partners who can help you take that work so that we can work together around positive engagement. Because when you have high levels of chronic absence in your schools, it is not a school's alone. You only want, there's one teacher, there's what, 30, 40 kids in a classroom? We need more supports coming in. But we need to use our data to know where that's necessary. We have to have shared accountability, but it's shared amongst all of us. This is not about a blame game. This is about collective responsibility. And then we also have to build capacity so everyone knows how to use this data to build a tiered system of support together. What I am so glad to do is I'm going to invite Mel Atkins and Shanae edmund Verily to come up, please. Mel and Shanae are part of Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is an amazing story. It's, my, it's one of the stories that inspires me because Grand Rapids, like Detroit, has faced real challenges around poverty, real challenges around how do you take this data out and make it a community that call to action for a community solution. Uh, Mel, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I just know what you do, but I'm now realizing, what is your title, Mel? Long title. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Yeah, my name is Mel Atkins. I'm the executive director of Community Student Affairs for Grand Rapids Public Schools. What I will just say is Mel is my internal change agent in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. He has made sure they've had the data. He's made sure the principals are on board. He has been essential. And then Shanae here is a senior program officer. Senior program officer. With DeVos. And I just, my story is I'd been working in Grand Rapids for probably four or five years before I met Shanae and Mel. And at the time, Grand Rapids had a very rich community network called the Kent School Services Network which is doing fabulous work actually throughout the and collaborations with social services providers and in those schools where there was consistent leadership, we saw dramatic reductions in chronic absence. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't get it to go to scale. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get district-wide numbers. Shanae invited us in, worked, us, uh, worked with us, so that we could work with Mel, work with the then new superintendent, Teresa Neal. And that's really how the Grand Rapids story in its current version took place. So I'm going to ask the two of you to please share, and I'm hoping this is a little echoey. Um, I think I'm, I'm worried we're getting feedback from the mics. Um, I'm in, I'm gonna, anyway, let me start off with a story, and then I will, or a question that you And just let me know if you, oh, that's better, Little feedback. But Grand Rapids Schools, we are the fifth largest school district in, in the state of Michigan, just over 16,500 students. 82% um, of our kids have free reduced lunch. And we have 52 schools, so 52 programs in GRPS. And so, you know, what's not on here is we just passed a bond that we were pretty excited about, um, $175 billion, that's gonna touch of a lot of schools and bring us um, some schools and make it more equitable when, for their education. So that just passed this past November, but that shows that the community does support GRPS, which is, is a big thing. As you see in the back is our superintendent was actually in my role that I'm in now before she became superintendent. And so community engagement uh, was is near and dear to her heart. <laughs> She started as literally a student worker. It was, I'm gonna say, I don't know she was literally 14 or 16 years old, started in GRPS. And now she is the superintendent of the schools. And what that tells you is she's almost done every job along the way. She's, and it brings credibility because she's walked that walk. Um, she was, then she was a secretary. She's, she's walked it. And you never know where somebody's going. And so she was able to come in when we had a superintendent change 
just to really galvanize and saying, we have to look at attendance. The story behind it is we were trying to figure out with our data is why were we making gains when she took over as superintendent? What is it? And the only thing she said was, now take a look at attendance. <laughs> and I'll never forget that meeting. Take a look at it, that changed everything. Take a look at attendance. Um, take a look at Hetty's work. And then so I said, okay. You know, and then you, you kind of go back to your office and figure out what to do. You know, so I started to call on our community partner, one of the Shnei Evan Verley. Yeah, you know, I work for people who uh, need to stay in business. <laughs> you know, so the bottom line is they want change quickly, and they, they, they use their money to really leverage and invest in things. And I work for a unit that really is about unleashing potential, uh, um, that, that, that the power of potential that's in every single one of us. And, and, and so our trustee was really... Uh, just floored that we were leaving kids behind. And he said, we've got to stop doing that. What can we do? So he created a whole new um, department in our foundation to be able to look at this. And so I had, was at a conference, and I uh, heard of uh, Hetty's work. Uh, I knew she had been in Grand Rapids. We, uh, Mel and I, are like tied at the hips. And I said to him, you, you know, Mel, I'm wondering uh, if Grand Rapids has this problem. Because here's the deal. Hetty talked about the data being masked. That at the end of the day, because of government regulations and all these compliance things that many have to do, we were looking at the wrong metric. It's like the parable of the boiling frog, right? The, the frog starts to boil slowly until all of a sudden we find out that we have tons of kids not coming to school. And so this was a really, really uh, important thing. And we knew that this could leverage something uh, around academics. So when we look, yep. So when we looked at the data, this was uh, three years ago, we, we didn't know. We looked at truancy, average daily attendance like everyone else. We still look at those metrics, but that's not the only piece we realized that 36.4% of our students were chronically absent. So you, you put that over one in three are chronically absent. And then what we tried to do is put a face to it. Because sometimes you can get behind the numbers and the numbers are the numbers. But you have to put who are these students that are missing. And for the most part, they were black and brown kids that, that are missing school. And so what we did is we came out with a challenge. It was, yep. The numbers. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. So, so we went from 36.4% to right now our most up-to-date data um, through semester one is 21.1% of our students were, are chronically absent. Not where we're at, um, but if you look at from the beginning to now, that is a 42% reduction in chronic absenteeism. And the key with that, most of it came recently. With, with, with the, within this past year, year and a half. And then I, I get to that in a minute, but the, each division, elementary, middle, and high, have, have seen reductions in chronic absenteeism. Um, we still have issues at the high school level, you know, the older they get, the harder it becomes. Just this school year alone, when you look at the rate of chronic absenteeism, and you, every grade level between K through 12 is down when you're comparing um, the last two semesters, semester one this year compared to last year. Well, if you look at grades K, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 9, that rate of chronic absenteeism has reduced by more than 20%. And, and part of that is key, especially these transition grades. Mm -hmm. We started with kindergarten, for example, nationally and also in Grand Rapids, it shows that um, kids miss more days in, in kindergarten, K5, than any other grade. And, and we have held true with that every year. So, and, and I would say your best predictor of what's going to happen is your previous behavior. And so we have to get kids on the right track is, is one of them. Yep. So that's a good question. So what you see is the more years you are chronically absent, 
the more likelihood you're going to be below grade level. And we use, we have um, India, NWA, the map testing, um, to, to look at um, this data. Well, what you don't see on here is, so we looked at since we started our initiative. So it's less than 2% of the current students are considered persistently chronically absent. So that means since we started in 2013, those, if we just, some kids leave, some kids, we get new kids. The kids that have been there, less than 2% are, are, have been over these number of years. The, the rate of severe chronic absenteeism, the, 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 the worst category, we've, we've nearly cut that in half. So who, are, who is this imp impacting a lot? Is the kids that were missing a lot of school, sometimes 36 or more days. It was actually 48.1% of the students, um, we nearly cut that in half. Um, I would say. So there is, we're going to go through each one, but we looked at it as really five areas that we did. And I'll start with the district and site leadership. That the superintendent had to buy in. And how she bought in was this. She says she thinks chronic absenteeism is so important, she's going to make it part of her evaluation. <laughs> so her job now, a portion of it, is tied to getting kids to come to school. But guess what? If she does it, everybody else has to have it too. I have it on the superintendent's cabinet. All our principals have um, part of their evaluation. So she made it, this is important. And we know what's monitored gets done. You have to give people resources, but you also have to monitor. You have to, you have to give checks and balances. And, and if she's going to make it part of her evaluation, I'm, trust me, it, it, it's, it's, it's she holds everyone accountable with that. Community uh, partners. Yeah. Sure. Uh, which word am I clicking? Oh, bottom. bottom one. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I, I think that um, how many of you are in organizations that are uh, community and or um, uh, parent organizations in the audience here today? So we've got, we've got quite a few. Um, we're all tied together, and we're all in this together. And I appreciate that our, that our superintendent is from the community and had that job before and knew that there was power and resources. Uh, like Barrington said, all the resources that we, 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 we have all the resources that we need. And so um, um, we ended up um, really uh, harnessing the resources in the community. Uh, I run an organization or in initiative called I Believe I Become, which is a ground game. You know, it's about uh, 150 organizations, churches, uh, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, anyone that's not necessarily in education. And guess what? There's lots of passion, lots of uh, creativity, lots of innovation. And what school districts can do is really harness the power that's in those organizations. Because they uh, see kids, they know families, they are connected in ways that um, they want to see these improvements happen. And what you, what you would see is that folks just had a, a level of enthusiasm that was incredible. And um, they began to uh, mobilize. We clearly said, let's move this needle, and we can do it together. And every single one of those organizations got on board. In fact, after a while, everyone was trying to come. You know, and so the question for Detroit is, is who is that entity that can bring together all of your community-based organizations and all those parent organizations to empower them so that we are all on the same uh, page? In Collective Impact, there's this idea called mutually reinforcing, you know, and that's what we want to be doing is mutual reinforcement. So we look at it in Grand Rapids as really kind of three prongs to this addressing chronic absenteeism. There's a district level response, there's a building level response, and then also community response. Before we even started, we had to make a mind shift though. 
we, the mind shift we made was, we're going to share this data publicly. You, know, you don't have to foyer it. You don't have to be savvy parent to get it. We're going to share it because we have a plan. If we didn't have a plan, we wouldn't feel comfortable sharing it. We went out and contacted the media and said, at the time, 36% restaurants were chronically absent. They were not asking for it. We said, we're going to give it to them. Because we thought everyone played a role in this, in this message. So what we did was, with, with um, Community Foundation, create the plan, but establish the baseline. So we had to, we had to tell people, what does that mean? What is, that, what is chronic absenteeism? What are some resources? What are some strategies? Retraining the system. You know, and, and that doesn't happen overnight. It really doesn't. But you have to be persistent in your message. Um, then we had toolkits. Uh, we, we pushed um, a, a data on a weekly basis. We have weekly reports, monthly reports, quarterly reports, end of the year reports. Data has to be um, actionable, but also timely. You know, that was, and then and at the school level, they had to start to engage their students, engage their parents um, through goal setting, um, inspiring their staff. You know, teachers play a role in this. Um, rerunning the campaign. We had a, um, a campaign. We switched our campaign now. It's Challenge 5. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we had, a, we had a previous campaign before. That didn't work as well. And then at the community level, yeah, I'm going to stand up because I, 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 I just get excited about this. But let me just say this, that at the community level, the power of actually having data. Now think about this. How in the world could we help if we can't see, right? And so the, 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 the boldness that the district had to push data through master data sharing agreements to uh, uh, nonprofits, to churches, to organizations, and said, here are all of our kids. And here's what we can do about it. And I'll give you an example. I used to be out in the field, and I remember one young man would start showing up all the time. And, and he would get come to the organization earlier and earlier and earlier. And I asked our staff, I said, why is this kid here at 12 o'clock? He would say he was out of school. He was out of class, you know, and so forth and so on. If we had had the data at that time, what we found out is the kid wasn't going to school. You know, so the power of the data itself is really important. And I also would say that uh, when you're connecting with, with uh, uh, parents at the aspirational level, we would have these community meetings and we, and, 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 and we, we ask the parents, what is the, the, the idea that's keeping your kids from being successful? And parents begin to define these things. And then we, we rallied and we had like, uh, this rally cry, we, we go, I believe, I become, I believe, I become. And parents began to, to do, you know, folks would even come to these neighborhood meetings um, having saved up all their money so they could get on the bus because they were so inspired. Because at the end of the day, families care deeply about their kids, you know, and community organizations care deeply and are in, 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 in relationships with families. And so when we're all on the same page, the power of really transforming a whole community, you can see it in these numbers that you see here. One thing I wanted to reiterate that Shanae just said was, and we'll, we'll put kind of my hat, the district hat back on. We were a district, I think, like most districts in the sense that we read every book, <laughs> We read every research article. We knew what it said. So our way, a few years ago, of gauging parents, we said, only if parents did this. Because we, we, we're the experts, mm. you know. But guess what? Didn't work. No one showed up. And you're in the same rut that you're in. And it's easy to fall in. You know, you're always busy. There's always a deadline. But we never slowed down until we really started to partner with um, Sinead and her team. And it was through the neighborhood engagement meetings that they was held at our schools. It was held at our schools. They were easily getting four or 500 people each event. Each that, neighborhood. Each, each neighborhood. neighborhood. And we were getting, at the same school, four or five people. We said, why is that? And part of it, and the reason why is how you engage 
um, families. We were coming at it from the knower stance. Mm -hmm. We know it, and if you just do this. They came about it, how do we collectively come together? So, Mel and Shanae, I know our friend Karen Mapp will pick up on these things, yep. but we are going to have to keep moving okay. along okay. our okay. slides. Uh, so, yep, I'll keep moving. So what happened with that is, obviously we jumped on board, and we said we're going to change our mental model of how we do parent engagement. And so here is our structure of our parent engagement model. And, we, and the attendance challenge falls under this model. Because we have to engage, you have to engage parents. Um, challenge five. This jumps right to challenge. Five. Um, this is the parent. Oh, uh, parent university. So parent university was uh, parents asked for. Because uh, now we have a new model. We're partnering with parents. We're, we're not coming out with just solutions. We're saying, asking for your opinion, and it was through, uh, we, we through the neighborhood engagement model, that. Parents asked for resources, tools, and it was around these bucket areas. It wasn't called parent university at the time. We, know, we didn't know what we were going to call it. It was like, I need help on effective parenting. I need help to navigate the educational system. You have all this jargon. You have all these things. I don't, I don't get it. Personal growth and development, health and wellness are our four areas. And so we, we really, it took almost two years, and it threw a superintendent change to get this off the ground. But we partnered with um, parents, community partners, for two, literally two years. You think about initiatives, usually initiatives have to happen tomorrow. But this one did. Yeah. And let me just say this, that actually the parents did come up with Parent University. There is wisdom in the, in the community, and they know what they need if we would listen to them. And I appreciate that the district and the superintendent did that because they, and when they formed their own action groups, parents said, we need a parent university. And then when we brought them together as the foundation, we asked them, what's the vision? And you know what they said? Confident advocates of our children's success. That's what we want to be. And so, family, so, so, so they began to do that. Um, and then we started putting um, this thing called um, what we're now calling Challenge 5. Mel alluded to that we initially had a campaign that seemed to be a little bit more out of reach. You know, uh, it was called Make Every Day Count. Um, and I was standing at a big community event. There were about 4,000 people in the park. And I was trying to tell them about this thing. And, and, and I, I said, you know, they don't know what to do. What is it that they need to do? What's the benchmark? You know, so I'm up there, no more than five, no more than five. And then we, our communications people heard that, and they said, Sinead, we can say that better and more succinctly. And that's how we got challenge five. Challenge five, strive for less than five. It makes sense, right? Everybody could do it. I know not what the benchmark is. So when my kid's missing two weeks, I'm like, whoa, strive for less than five. And then we put our body parts in it. And we, everybody started walking around doing this little five thing. You know, and so all of a sudden, everybody could uh, know what we were trying to, what, that we were pulling in a certain direction and knew exactly what the metric would be. And just quickly, and can we have like one more minute? Sure. Is if you go into any one of our schools, we think disruptive messaging is the right way to go. Don't hide behind, the, don't hide the numbers. We have these huge leaderboards. And it's, it's really a grade level challenge. Every month they post, for example, kindergarten versus first grade versus second grade versus third grade. As soon as you walk in, that's the first thing you see at every school. And the school has to be able to articulate what's the plan. Because you're not going to see 100% on any board. Now, I can tell you that this was really shocking um, to, and, I, and, I, and we should give Mel Atkins and Teresa Neal no. uh, a big hand clap because um, that's both to expose yourself and to put it right out there on Front Street. And when our communications people said, we're gonna put some big leaderboards out there and they're gonna be eight feet, eight feet big. And we were like, oh my gosh, you know, and we're gonna actually put the data out there. I tell you, you know, can I say this? Some principals sort of kind of wanted to put that back in their office. The but you know- The first year, yeah. They, they did. But you know what? Um, when when, when um, they dared to do it, they took the courage, they had bravery, and when those leaderboards are up there with the real numbers, 
uh, teachers could see it, principals could see it, but community members could see it and they were like, we can do better than this. You know, and that is begin to, I think, really inspire yep. uh, um, things. And we want to keep moving along okay. here. The last slide is really because the, the theme is everyone plays a role in this. Yeah. Is we start meeting with local churches, uh, uh, businesses, uh, departments, you know, any stores. And we have maps across the city. If we zoomed in on this map, it would be actually GRP, uh, Grand Rapids streets. You know, if you live in, it'll make, it means something if you live in Grand Rapids. And it shows you how many students in that little, that zone are chronically absent. So the big number is the big number. But now for you, we have in this two block radius uh, for the past, I need you to talk to your church because you have 20 students that are chronically absent. Mm -hmm. You know, I need you over this, this business when you see this kid um, during school hours not coming to school to come to your, to your store. What are you going to do about it? So now the whole community. I mean, police, community policing is asking a question as opposed to, you know, interacting in some negative way. You know, um, why aren't you in school? Aren't you supposed to be in school? So everybody now is on message. We, we actually um, created billboards in these neighborhoods based on these geo maps. You know, we've got kids here, then are we going to post a big old billboard? And I can tell you from all of our research, we've seen that parents get information from word of mouth and from billboards. So we flanked uh, businesses and we flanked churches and we flanked schools with uh, yard signs, like the political signs, with yard signs. And, and it, it, all, it all had a kid strive for less than five. Now everybody, because everybody wants to do um, of the right thing. They, they want to be on purpose and they want their kids succeeding. So first of all, can you join me in giving an inc a hand to our colleagues in Grand Rapids? They do such amazing work. You can see how you can go from 37% chronic absence to 21% that's been in the last three years with the greatest gains in the last 18 months. A couple quick things for you to take from this. This doesn't happen overnight. It took over, the first year we didn't get any outcomes. No. It wasn't until the second year that you started to yeah. see outcomes. By the way, Attendance Works was gone by the time. We were, <laughs> we had, we'd helped in the beginning build an infrastructure. It was Mel, Shanae, and the incredible team that was in place that made this happen. So you also, in Detroit, you're gonna have to figure out who's the team. Yeah. The second thing you need to remember from this is 80% of what you're gonna try in Detroit, someone else tried. Mm. You got a lot going on in Grand Rapids. If you try to start your effort from scratch, you'll never get it to the point where you have the 20%, which I call tailoring and making that real to your own realities and your own strengths. That's where you wanna be able to focus on. Mm -hmm. You wanna be able to take as much as you can from Grand Rapids, from anywhere else who has similar populations to yours, and then you wanna make it your own and make it that you have your own champions who will move this work out and make sure your kids in Detroit are in school so they can learn. Thank you.